Raymond Patriarca, also known as The Man, was a towering figure in the American Mafia, emerging as a dominant force in the 1950s, leading the New England crime family. Renowned for his strategic acumen, he expanded the family's influence into gambling, loan sharking, and other illicit enterprises. Patriarca faced legal challenges, including a trial for murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Despite being convicted and sentenced to prison, he continued to oversee his family's operations. His ability to navigate the legal system and maintain control over his criminal empire, even from behind bars, underscored his cunning and influence within the criminal underworld. Raymond Salvatore Laredo Patriarca, a first-generation Italian-American, was born on March 17, 1908, on Shrewsbury Street in Worcester, Massachusetts, but soon moved with his family to Providence, Rhode Island. His father, Eluterio, managed a liquor store there. Despite growing up in a loving family, Patriarca's early years showed no signs of his future in crime. The family lived on Atwell's Avenue, where his mother, Mary, maintained a neat home. According to the FBI files, Patriarca completed only eight grades of school and attended an auto repair school for five days. However, there are accounts which state that Patriarca left school at the age of eight and would go on to shine shoes and work as a bellhop. Raymond Patriarca managed to steer clear of trouble until his world was shaken by the death of his father in 1925 when Raymond was just 17 years old. With his father's guiding influence gone, Raymond quickly turned to a darker path. Shortly after his father's passing, Raymond was arrested for bootlegging having joined the mob as an associate and taken on a job as a guard for liquor shipments. What they didn't realize was that Raymond, being enterprising and bold, often orchestrated the hijacking of the very shipments he was supposed to protect. His bosses either didn't notice the pattern or chose not to confront Raymond directly. Referring to the FBI files, Patriarca's arrests date back to 1926, and his criminal activities include violation of the National Prohibition Act, prostitution, burglary, larceny, and armed robbery. In October 1927, Patriarca pled guilty to violating the National Prohibition Act in August 1926 and was fined $100. As a result for the breaking out of jail in August 1926, he was sentenced in March 1927 to 30 days at the Providence County Jail. His next arrest was on February 27, 1928, for breaking and entering, which resulted in his conviction in January 1929, and he was sentenced to two years in Rhode Island State Prison. In the same year, that is 1929, Raymond was formally inducted into the Mafia. During the Prohibition era, the mob had no shortage of young recruits willing to lie, steal, and kill their way up the ranks of La Cosa Nostra. Raymond quickly proved himself a skilled learner and would later become a master of the mob's criminal techniques. In 1932, Patriarca and two accomplices were charged with robbing the Webster National Bank in central Massachusetts. They held the bank manager, tellers, and customers at gunpoint, calmly emptying the safe of $10,000. Although numerous eyewitnesses identified Patriarca as the perpetrator, they later recanted their testimony, and he was acquitted in what was called a sudden case of mass amnesia. Patriarca's fortunate streak continued until 1938 when he walked into a Brookline, Massachusetts factory wielding a pistol. He pressed the gun against the owner's head demanding access to the safe, which was rumored to contain a significant amount of jewelry. After forcing the owner and two employees to undress, Patriarca and his accomplices looted the safe of $12,000 worth of jewelry, including necklaces, rings, and a peculiar gold pin. They also stole the owner's car and discarded the men's clothing. This audacious robbery took place just a few blocks from a police precinct, highlighting Patriarca's daring criminal exploits. The robbery had investigators puzzled until a few days later when they discovered a similar incident in Webster, Massachusetts, 
the same town Patriarcha had targeted previously. A barking dog alerted police to a burglary at the United Optical Plant, which stored an estimated $8,000 in gold used for manufacturing gold eyeglass frames. While the burglars were still inside, six local police officers surrounded the factory and ordered the men to exit with their hands raised. The burglars complied. Patriarcha initially gave police a false name, but his true identity was revealed during a search of his vehicle. Inside the vehicle, police found what was described as one of the most complete sets of burglary tools ever seen in this part of New England. A suitcase in Patriarcha's vehicle contained a variety of burglary tools, along with the peculiar gold pin stolen in the previous robbery. The factory owner, Clarence Wallbank, identified several stolen items found in Patriarcha's possession, implicating him as one of the robbers. Wallbank emerged as an ideal witness for prosecutors, being a credible business leader who resisted Patriarcha's intimidation tactics, or so they believed. In December 1938, at the behest of corrupt Irish politician Daniel H. Coakley, Joseph Patriarcha, Raymond's brother, approached Wallbank on two occasions. Joseph offered Wallbank $7,000 and his life in exchange for recanting his testimony. Wallbank, however, wrote a letter to the governor's council advocating for Raymond Patriarcha's pardon. Coakley, deeming Wallbank's letter insufficient, authored a new one, which Wallbank signed. This new letter swiftly secured a pardon from Governor Charles Francis Hurley and the governor's council, leading to Raymond Patriarcha's release after less than three months in prison. Both Coakley and Wallbank demonstrated their willingness to compromise their integrity for personal gain. However, local reporters exposed the corruption, leading to widespread public outrage and a significant political scandal. Coakley faced impeachment, and the pardon's legitimacy was questioned. The pardon petition, as detailed in the 14 Articles of Impeachment, highlighted various irregularities, including fraudulent signatures of three priests, one of whom didn't exist. Coakley's document falsely claimed that Patriarcha was wholly guiltless of armed robbery, omitting the fact that Patriarcha had actually pleaded guilty to the crime. The Massachusetts State Senate would vote to oust Coakley from the Governor's Council in October 1941, marking the first impeachment of a state official in over a century. By February 1939, Patriarcha had married Helen G. Mandela, a nurse whose sister worked for Leverett Saltonstall the successor to Massachusetts Governor Hurley, and a future U.S. Senator. Helen later gave birth to their first and only child, Raymond J. Patriarcha. In the coming years, Raymond would cultivate a reputation as a formidable and influential figure. He would demonstrate his political acumen by corrupting vulnerable lawmakers and show a ruthless willingness to eliminate his rivals. From the early 1930s to the late 1950s, the New England rackets were dominated by Filippo Filbucola and his right-hand man, Joe Lombardo. Their ascent to power culminated in a decisive move in December 1931 when Lombardo orchestrated the assassination of the leader of a formidable gang. The Gustin Gang, named after a short street in South Boston, was headed by the Wallace brothers, Steve, Jimmy and Frank. Originally known as the Tailboard Thieves, the Gustin Gang evolved during Prohibition to control a significant portion of illegal alcohol trafficking in New England, expanding their influence with a fleet of rum-running boats and deep political connections in Boston. Initially, Lombardo proposed a territorial split along Boston's waterfront, attempting to negotiate with the powerful Wallace brothers. However, negotiations soured, leading to Frankie Wallace's fatal mistake of agreeing to a meeting at the enemy's stronghold without posting a lookout. The ensuing ambush resulted in the deaths of Wallace and Barney Walsh, solidifying Lombardo's standing in Boston's criminal underworld. Filippo Filbocola, who arrived in the United States from Palermo, Sicily in 1920, was an unconventional mafia figure from the start. He presented himself more like a scholarly gentleman than a typical mob boss and he was known for his involvement in boxing, managing a stable of fighters in the city. Allegedly anointed as the leader of the New England Mafia in 1932 by Charles Lucky Luciano's mob commission in New York, Bacola 
alongside Lombardo, eliminated the Gustin gang as a threat. With their sights set on Charles King Solomon, another local mobster who managed boxers, Bacala and Lombardo faced a formidable opponent. Solomon, akin to Dutch Schultz in New York, was a prominent Jewish gangster, bootlegger, and narcotics trafficker, known as one of the most powerful figures in organized crime. Assisting the Big Seven, which included Luciano, Maya Lansky, and Frank Costello, Solomon played a significant role in organizing crime syndicates across the United States when they gathered in Atlantic City in May 1929. However, Solomon met his demise on January 24, 1933, when he was gunned down by four Irish assailants at his nightclub, the Cotton Club. Refusing to cooperate with detectives, Solomon, with his last words, condemned those who had shot him. Although James Skeets Coyne and John Burke, two Irish criminals, were implicated in the murder, the true orchestrators behind Solomon's assassination have remained a subject of speculation. Bacola and Lombardo are among the suspects, as they stood to benefit from Solomon's elimination. With Bacola established as the godfather of Boston, the Sicilian-born mobster inevitably drew the attention of federal authorities, despite his efforts to maintain a veneer of legitimacy. Pursued by investigators from the Kefauver Committee, Bacola and his wife fled to his homeland, Sicily. Interestingly, Bacola's departure was not viewed as a betrayal by the Mafia, neither in New England nor in New York. Rather, it was embraced. The New England Mafia was in urgent need of strong leadership, as Joe Lombardo's strength lay in his ability to operate discreetly, leaving a void in organizational structure. This lack of cohesion resulted in a fragmented landscape of organized crime, with each gang or faction acting independently, though the Italians held the most sway. The arrival of Raymond L. S. Patriarca in 1954, selected by Lombardo and other high-ranking mafia figures, marked the dawn of a new era, providing the much-needed authoritative leadership previously embodied by Bacola. In 1952, Patriarca eliminated his final rival in Providence, Carlton O'Brien, a 49-year-old former bootlegger and armed robber who had transitioned into a racketeer, directly competing with the Mafia for control of the city's profitable race wire services. These services collected horse racing results from tracks nationwide and transmitted them to bookmakers for a fee. Initially, O'Brien collaborated with the Italians, investing in the Ferrara Rossetti wire service based in East Boston. However, due to the constant relocation of the Ferrara Rossetti operation to evade law enforcement, the costs escalated. O'Brien, unwilling to pay the higher fees, established his own race wire service, much to the Mafia's displeasure. Patriarca received the order to dismantle O'Brien's operation. Despite Patriarca's efforts, raiding O'Brien's betting establishments, robbing his bookies and violently assaulting his runners. O'Brien remained resolute. Additionally, O'Brien faced legal troubles as he was suspected of masterminding the infamous 1950 Brinks job in Boston. Patriarch's men executed O'Brien as he returned home one night, ending his life with two shotgun blasts to the chest. Police initially linked O'Brien's murder to the Brinks robbery, and Patriarca remained unsuspected. O'Brien's killers were never apprehended. Following O'Brien's demise, Patriarca solidified his control over Providence, subsequently extending his dominance to the surrounding New England states in a monumental power shift. By 1953, as stated in Patriarca's FBI files, he was hungry for money and was operating a shakedown racket in the Federal Hill section. According to an informant, Patriarca has a group of young fellows going around to merchants asking for protection money and, if they refused to donate, they usually had their stores broken into or their windows smashed. By 1954, with Bacola's retirement, Providence emerged as the hub of the New England family's operations. Patriarca managed his criminal empire from a modest two-story building nicknamed The Office. This building housed the National Cigarette Service Company and coin distributors, a vending machine and pinball business in Atwell's Avenue in Providence, in a neighborhood known as Federal Hill. In February 1959, Patriarca was summoned to Washington, D.C. 
to testify before the U.S. Senate Select Committee on Improper Activities in Labor Management, also known as the McClellan Hearings. This presented a significant opportunity for Senator Robert Kennedy, who aspired for his anti-corruption efforts to surpass the impact of the widely publicized Key Favre hearings of 1952. Senator Kennedy aggressively pursued the mob during the committee's 270 days of testimony, confronting figures like Teamsters Union President Jimmy Hoffa. He also accused Chicago mob boss Sam Giancana of evasive behavior. While Giancana and other mafia leaders invoked their Fifth Amendment rights, Patriarcha chose not to. When questioned about allegations of violence and intimidation by his employees at the National Cigarette Service Vending Machine Company in Providence, Patriarcha denied the accusations, portraying himself as a legitimate businessman unfairly targeted by law enforcement. Kennedy pressed Patriarcha about the source of the $80,000 to $90,000 he used to establish his vending machine business suggesting it was illicitly obtained. Patriarcha claimed the money was a gift from his dying mother, left for him in a box in the family basement. Kennedy, harboring a deep disdain for Patriarcha, would later refer to him as that pig on the hill, alluding to the gangster's headquarters on Federal Hill in Providence. Kennedy vowed to bring Patriarcha to justice, setting the stage for a long-standing feud. Meanwhile, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, who had long denied the existence of the Mafia, was forced to confront the issue after the Appalachian mob meeting on November 14, 1957, provided undeniable proof of organized crime's existence. Despite this, Hoover took another four years to address the problem directly, finally launching the top echelon criminal informant program on June 21, 1961, under pressure from Kennedy's Justice Department. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover emphasized that the most significant information developed to date indicates organization among the nation's hoodlum leaders. This information, gathered from highly confidential sources in Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, and Newark, New Jersey, suggested the existence of a nine- or twelve-member commission overseeing major criminal activities in the United States. The memo identified several alleged mafia bosses, including Vito Genovese, Tommy Lucchese, Carlo Gambino, Joseph Bonanno, and Sam Giancana. Raymond Patriarca was named as the top Boston hoodlum, and Joseph Zarelli, John LaRocca, Stefano Mogadino, Joseph Ida, and Angelo Bruno were identified as the bosses of Detroit, Pittsburgh, Buffalo, Newark, and Philadelphia, respectively. The FBI memo meticulously detailed the mafia hierarchy identifying bosses and underbosses in small cities, with major cities like New York having as many as six capo regimes or lieutenants. Emphasizing the importance of quality informants, the top echelon criminal informant program called for immediate and extensive implementation. With a notable push from Bobby Kennedy's Justice Department, the FBI seemed poised for a more aggressive stance against organized crime. In a significant breakthrough in March 1962, FBI agents successfully installed electronic microphone surveillance in Raymond Patriarca's office at the Coinomatic Distributing Company. Daily logs and tape recordings of conversations from Patriarca's office were carefully examined by the FBI, utilizing a technique initially deployed by the FBI's intelligence division against communists in the late 1950s. These wiretaps provided further compelling evidence suggesting Patriarca's involvement in the Mafia Commission. Despite Bobby Kennedy's distrust of Director J. Edgar Hoover, he ensured that the FBI was not the only agency targeting Patriarcha. The IRS and U.S. Marshals also closely monitored him, with Marshals even establishing a surveillance post in a nearby two-story apartment building. That year, a young Marshal named John Partington served Patriarcha with a subpoena, unaware that the FBI had bugged Patriarcha's office. After Partington's visit, Patriarcha was captured on tape complaining to his attorney, which led to the FBI significantly expanding its investigation to include other members of Patriarcha's inner circle. They included underboss Enrico Tomaleo and Gennaro Angiulo. The Boston Irish Gang War started in 1961 and lasted until 1967. It was fought between the McLaughlin Gang of the Boston neighborhood of Charlestown, led by Bernie McLaughlin, and the Winter Hill Gang of Somerville, 
led by James Buddy McLean. The two gangs had maintained a fragile peace until an incident at Salisbury Beach during Labor Day weekend in 1961. At a party, Georgie McLaughlin made an unwelcome advance towards a Winter Hill gang member's girlfriend, leading to a brutal beating that left him unconscious outside a local hospital. Bernie McLaughlin sought retribution from Buddy McLean, demanding the assailants be handed over, but McLean refused. Viewing this as an affront, the McLaughlins attempted to rig a bomb to McLean's wife's car. In response, McLean fatally shot McLaughlin outside the Morning Glory Bar in Charlestown in October 1961, sparking Boston's infamous Irish gang war. Raymond Patriarca had been monitoring the Boston mob war from a distance for some time. Initially, the New England Mafia boss was content to watch as the Irish gangs clashed believing that the elimination of Irish gangsters would pave the way for greater Italian control over Boston's criminal enterprises. However, Patriarca was compelled to intervene when the war began to affect his own operations. The Winter Hill Gang and the McLaughlin Brothers Gang saw their profits dwindle as their members hid in apartments, only venturing out briefly. This disrupted their bookmaking operations, leading the McLaughlins to extort other Boston bookies, including those paying tribute to Jerry Angiulo. Feeling the financial strain and unwilling to confront the McLaughlins alone, Angiulo sought Raymond Patriarca's intervention to end the mob war. Patriarca, determined to stop the killings, threatened to declare martial law if the violence didn't cease. He instructed Henry Tomaleo to arrange a meeting between Buddy McLean and the surviving McLaughlin brothers, Punchy and Georgie, which took place at the Ebtide Lounge in early January 1965. During the meeting, Tomaleo noticed that both Georgie and Punchy McLaughlin were carrying small paper bags containing their guns. Concerned about the potential for violence, Tomaleo called off the meeting and reported the situation to Patriarca. He proposed that they pick a side in the Irish mob war, and Patriarca agreed. The Mafia would support Buddy McLean and the Winter Hill Gang, aiming to eliminate anyone associated with the McLaughlin brothers. In February 1965, Georgie McLaughlin was arrested and on March 3, 1965, Patriarca met with Joseph the Animal Barboza through Vincent Jimmy the Bear Flemmy. A week later, on March 12, 1965, the body of Edward Deegan, a member of the McLaughlin gang, was discovered in an alleyway in Chelsea, Massachusetts, with a 12-inch screwdriver near his left hand. On March 15, 1965, Special Agent Paul Rico drafted a memo stating that he had received information five days prior to the murder of Edward Deegan that Raymond Patriarca had ordered the hit. Rico also noted that a close associate of Deegan's had agreed to set him up. On March 19, 1965, James Hanley, the special agent in charge of the Boston office, informed Hoover of the individuals responsible for Deegan's murder, which included Barboza and Flemmy. When Patriarca learned of the Deegan murder, he was furious. He had not authorized Flemmy to carry out the hit. Patriarca had instructed the hitmen to wait for his approval, pending a decision from Jerry Angelo. However, Angelo claimed he had not given any such order and suspected that Vincent Flemmy was a police informant due to his close relationship with a Boston police detective. Jerry demanded that Vincent Flemmy be hunted down and killed. Vincent Flemmy sought help from his brother. Stephen the Rifleman Flemmy, who met with Barboza shortly after. Stephen informed Barboza that law enforcement had placed a bug on Jerry Angelo's phone, and they had access to the recordings. He claimed to have listened to the tapes himself and heard that Jerry had ordered a hit on Barboza. However, Stephen did not mention that Vincent was the actual target of the Mafia's plot. After this conversation, Barboza turned to his mentor, Enrico Tomaleo, for advice. Tomaleo assured Barboza that he would intervene to prevent any harm against him. Still unsure, Barboza sought the counsel of his friend, James Buddy McLean. The Winter Hill boss quickly gathered 30 of his most capable gang members for a meeting. McLean said that he wanted everybody to know that he's sending word to Raymond that Joe Barboza was his partner and that he would protect him. Following their discussion, Joe Barboza was removed from Jerry Angela's hit list but his friend Vincent Flemmy remained a target. On the evening of May 3, 1965, as the bear was on his way to meet Barboza, he was shot while leaving his Roxbury residence. 
Aware of the escalating tensions, the Boston police moved quickly to apprehend Barboza, Stephen Flemmy, and other individuals intent on seeking immediate retaliation. Stephen Flemmy later received news that his brother would survive. On September 7, 1965, Patriarca's wife, Helen Patriarca, succumbed to cancer. In July 1966, Raymond Patriarca demonstrated his unwavering control over the New England rackets in a decisive manner. Learning that bookie Willie Marfeo had started his own operation on Federal Hill in Providence without paying tribute, Patriarca sent his underboss Henry to Maleo to warn Marfeo. When Marfeo defiantly refused, Patriarca ordered his elimination. Marfeo was gunned down, signaling to both law enforcement and the underworld that Patriarca's authority was not to be questioned. The conflict within the Irish mob had resulted in Patriarca losing millions in revenue. The once bustling mob town had now turned into a deserted place, with money flowing in at a much slower pace. The fear of violence had deterred individuals from visiting gambling parlors, racetracks, and mob controlled bars. Patriarca and his underbosses, Enrico Tomaleo and Jerry Angelo, were eager to revitalize business as Joe Barboza had become a significant nuisance. Concurrently, law enforcement was prioritizing Barboza's apprehension. In the fall of 1966, a friend informed Barboza that a contract had been put out on him by Rudy Marfeo, who blamed Barboza for his brother's murder in Providence a few months earlier. In October 1966, Barboza realized that this was an effort to get rid of him and soon came to terms with his falling out with Patriarca after he and three local hoodlums were arrested on weapons charges while cruising the streets of Boston. District Attorney Garrett Byrne released a statement following the arrest in which he called Barboza, the biggest killer in the Commonwealth. Byrne claimed that police were tipped off by a reliable informant that Barboza was on his way to commit a murder on the night in question. Barboza's bail was set at a substantial $100,000. Nicky Femia was detained with bail set at half that amount, while Arthur Bratzos and Patsy Fabiano were released. Garrett Byrne made it clear that Barboza was not to be assisted, and his office would take strong action against anyone attempting to bail him out. This warning provided Patriarca with the perfect excuse. Barboza had assembled a group of soldiers whom he trusted to remain loyal. However, this loyalty was now under scrutiny as he was incarcerated in the infamous Charles Street Jail. Ratsos paid Barboza a visit at Charles Street and, feeling accountable for Barboza's situation, informed him that the crew had taken to the streets to gather bail funds. They had managed to collect just over $70,000, and Patriarca's office had pledged to cover the rest. On the night of November 15, 1966, ten days after Barboza's arrest, Arthur Bratzos and Tommy DePrisco entered the Nightlight Cafe on Commercial Street in the North End. Larry Bayoni, Jerry Angulo's top enforcer instructed Barboza's crew to bring all the cash they had raised for Barboza's bail. Bratzos and DePrisco had collected $82,000 and were assured they would receive an additional $18,000 at the meeting. Despite the obvious setup, Barboza's men, driven by their loyalty to him, failed to recognize the danger. Upon entering the nightlight, Bratzos and DePrisco were swiftly surrounded by Bayoni and eleven other mobsters who declared that no assistance would be given by the office. The two men were brutally attacked, sustaining stab wounds and gunshot wounds. Bratzos was shot twice in the head, while DePrisco was shot four times at close range in the head as well. Their bodies were placed in Bratzos's Cadillac and driven to South Boston, where the vehicle was left abandoned in a vacant lot at the intersection of A and West 4th Streets. Several mobsters, including Edward Bennett, anonymously contacted the police. The Cadillac containing the bodies of DePrisco and Bratzos was discovered in the early morning hours. Upon arriving at the night light, officers caught Ralphie Lamatina, the bar owner and a mafia soldier, and his associates in the midst of the cover-up. When Patriarca learned of the killings, he was furious. He admonished Larry Bayoni, suggesting that he should have disposed of the bodies discreetly instead of dumping them in South Boston. Angelo managed to avoid trouble by persuading Ralphie to surrender and plead guilty to being an accessory after the fact. Angelo assured Patriarca that Ralphie would protect the family's interests and prevent a protracted investigation. 
Despite this, Patriarcha remained unsatisfied and convened a meeting in Boston with Angelo, Bayone, Ralphie, and others, including former underboss Joe Lombardo. Patriarcha, unable to be seen meeting with these individuals, delegated the task to his underboss, Enrico Tumaleo, to act as a mediator. Tumaleo emphasized to Ralphie that failure to comply with the plan would result in dire consequences, suggesting that he would not survive the afternoon. At the request of Barboza, probably his last remaining crew member, Patsy Fabiano, was taken into custody. In late January 1967, Barboza was found guilty on weapons charges and sentenced four to five years in Walpole State Prison. In early February 1967, Stephen Flemmy became an FBI informant. Shortly after, he began frequenting Walpole State Prison. By June 1967, Joe Barboza had also become an FBI informant. Barboza then provided some details about the murders of Teddy Deegan and Willie Marfeo. In early May 1967, a patriarch, a soldier named Louis the Fox Taglianetti, stood trial for tax evasion. His legal team pressured the FBI to disclose any evidence they had in the case, and, much to their dismay, the FBI handed over everything. These included files containing memos about wiretaps on Patriarcha's headquarters. These wiretaps had captured details of several mafia murders, including Taglianetti's assassination of a hired killer named Jackie Mad Dog Nazarian. Nazarian had been responsible for one of the most notorious mob murders in U.S. history, the assassination of Murder Incorporated Chief Albert Anastasia. Nazarian sealed his fate when he boasted that he could be a more efficient and fearsome crime boss than Patriarcha. In response, Patriarcha had Nazarian shot five times. The wiretaps dealt a severe blow to Patriarcha and his grip on the New England Mafia. Law enforcement officials were concerned that he would become more dangerous and violent as he fought to maintain his power. Just a week after the wiretaps became public, Joe Barboza was summoned before a grand jury to provide information about the Marfeo murder. Barboza also incriminated underboss Jerry Angiulo in his testimony, with the killing of Rocco Di Zelio. Federal agents swiftly acted, indicting Patriarcha and Tamaleo on June 20, 1967, for conspiracy to murder in the 1966 killing of Providence bookmaker Willie Marfeo. Subsequently, on August 9, 1967, Jerry and Julo was arrested. Barboza testified before a 21-man secret grand jury in late September 1967. He was subsequently transferred from the Barnstable House of Corrections to the custody of the U.S. Marshal Service. Barboza would later become one of the first informants to enter the witness protection program. In late March 1968, Patriarcha was sentenced to five years in prison and a $10,000 fine. However, the court permitted him to remain free on a $25,000 bond pending an appeal. In April 1968, Patriarcha ordered the murder of Willie's brother, Rudolf Marfeo. Rudolf, like his brother, had challenged Patriarcha's control over gambling operations and sought revenge for Willie's death. Patriarcha personally orchestrated this hit, employing five of his own men, including Maurice Lerner. In March 1969, Patriarcha began serving a prison sentence at the Federal Penitentiary in Atlanta, Georgia, for his role in the murder of Willie Marfeo. The Patriarcha verdict marked a significant moment in the federal government's fight against organized crime. It was the first time in history that a major mafia figure had been convicted solely based on the testimony of one of its associates. This event validated the FBI's belief that the most effective way to dismantle La Cosa Nostra was from within. While serving this sentence in Atlanta, he also received a 10-year term from Rhode Island for conspiring to kill Marfeo's brother, Rudolph, and his bodyguard, Anthony Millay. Legal issues continued to haunt Patriarcha throughout his life. In 1978, Vincent Teresa testified that he had been present in 1960 when the CIA allegedly offered the mob a contract to assassinate Cuban leader Fidel Castro. Teresa claimed that Patriarcha had assisted in selecting Maurice Lerner for the task, but that plot would never be carried out. In December 1983, Patriarcha was charged with ordering the 1965 murder of Raymond Baby Cujo. This was in retaliation for Raymond Cujo and Vincent Teresa burglarizing the home of Patriarcha's brother Joseph. On March 13, 1984, 
Patriarcha was arrested while in hospital for allegedly ordering the murder of bank robber Robert Candos in 1968. Patriarcha believed Candos was going to testify against him. On July 11, 1984, Raymond Salvatore Laredo Patriarca suffered a heart attack and died at the age of 76 